Okay, well, good morning, everyone. The sun is shining, I hope by you it is here. And I'm gonna just right away say welcome and turn things over to Barb to really officially welcome you to the 2023 member meeting for Wills. Good morning, everybody. I'm Barb Bratton and I'm chair of the Wills Board of Directors. And it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the entire Wills Board and staff to our annual member meeting. The annual meeting provides a venue for us to update you on what Wills is doing behind the scenes to support your diverse needs and interests. More importantly, it's a time to shine a light on work our members are doing in community with us and with one another. Today, we hear first from fellow members about their experiences breaking down barriers and opening doors. We know making your organizations accessible and welcoming is a daily challenge that you all address in different ways. Let's learn from each other. Before we dig into the meeting, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank my colleagues on the Wills Board. I'm so honored to work with all of them. These 13 individuals represent the reaches of our membership, both geographically and organizationally. These are the folks that represent your interests to Wills. We advise on policies or new service development, keep an eye on the financial health and sustainability of the organization, and help Wills staff think strategically about growth and innovation. Most importantly, we donate our time to help Wills be the best it can be. We encourage you to know who your board representatives are and to feel welcome in reaching out to them. And if serving on this board is an opportunity you're interested in, watch for the call for nominations coming soon for our upcoming spring election. So with that, let's get started. I'll turn things over to our executive director, Jennifer Chamberlain, for a few more introductions. Thanks so much, Barb. And good morning. Um, it is so wonderful to see many of you joining us today. And we know some of you will be watching this later on the recording. Um, as Barb said, my name is Jen Chamberlain and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of this amazing organization. Um, here's an overview somewhat of how things are gonna go today. Although um, we're gonna pivot a little bit, we've had some last minute changes. Um, so so uh, we're gonna start the meeting um, with focusing and hearing from members. And then the latter half of the meeting will be focused on what's happening here in the Wills offices. Um, we know you have no end of places to be um, and things to do on a Friday morning, especially what I think I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that it's been a crazy week for a lot of people. Um, we're hearing, uh, we know from the weather and everything that's been going on, it has been quite a week. So we made it to Friday, we're here, and we hope that you can enjoy the next um, next moments here in, in talking about what's going on with you and what's going on with us. So the last Friday in February has become kind of an informal holiday here at Wills, um, one that we look forward to. It's a day when we can share with you and hear from you and learn from each other. So on the screen, you're going to see the faces of Wills. Here is the Wills team. And I know you will recognize many of these folks as those people who are in your court, ready to help you get things done. Some of our staff um, are kind of behind the scenes, right? They're helping you manage subscriptions, pay invoices. Maybe they're taking meeting notes um, or negotiating the best price from the vendors we work with. Certainly there are faces on here that you recognize from meetings of various consortia we work with, or perhaps you've invited them to your library for a one-on-one -on -one consulting project. Whether you interact with us by email, by Zoom, or in person, I hope that what shines through all of these encounters is that the people at Wills love what they do, and we enjoy partnering with you because we believe your organizations really do make our world a better place for our communities, for those we work with, and we feel really lucky to play a small role in that effort. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share that recording to all who have registered. You're gonna also find it on our um, website and on our YouTube channel next week. 
Also, you're going to notice you can't unmute your microphone. Um, so when you have questions or comments, please use the chat and, and feel free to throw um, whatever you want our way in the chat and we will make sure to get those questions to our speakers um, as well as our staff. And we're going to hold some time for that later. Um, this year, uh, our member meeting theme we're really excited about, which is to hear from a couple of our members on how you are opening doors and reducing barriers. Um, many of those barriers that are deeply embedded either in long held practices from inside our organizations um, or just uh, at, in the community kind of steeped throughout the community at large. And I just lost my spot on my script here. Sorry about that. Um, so unfortunately, two of our scheduled speakers this morning um, had to cancel at the last minute due to personal reasons. Um, it's a good reminder to me, to all of us, that sometimes barriers or challenges pop up unexpectedly. And we know many of you have learned to be expert navigators of the unexpected. So we trust that you will be patient with us um, and we thank your understanding as we pivot a little bit here. We really do believe these first two projects we were going to hear from are really important. And so I'm just gonna to touch briefly on what Angela and Adrian were planning to present to you today. So Angela Zimmerman and her team at the Racine Public Library are breaking down barriers in a really innovative way. Their focus has been on how the library can be a better support to those most vulnerable in their community. From hiring a full-time social worker on staff to dismantling their traditional security services, the Racine Library is continuously reimagining how they can make their library welcoming and more accessible to everyone. Our second speaker um, was, is, is a current member of the Wills Board. Adrian Thunder um, is, a, like I said, a board member and also a recent partner in our Curating Indigenous Digital Collections Grant that Wills has in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. This project is built around an open source content management system called Mukutu. Um, it is designed to empower Native communities in managing and sharing their digital cultural heritage. As director of the Ho-Chunk Language Division, Adrian and her colleagues are building a digital language material repository containing over 30 plus years of written audio and video material designed to promote language learning and preservation. So there's so much that we could have learned from um, both Angie and Adrian that we are gonna try to find a way to share that information with you at a later date. So watch for more and we'll make sure that anyone who registered today will get um, a link to that information. So without further ado, I am happy to introduce you to our speaker this morning, Deb Anderson. Deb has been described as her institution's archivist evangelist, and she has spent her career building the UW Green Bay Archives and Area Research Center as their director. In partnership with the university course and the archives, the community archives project entitled Our Voices, LGBTQ Plus Stories of Northeastern Wisconsin was born. The goal of the project is to capture and preserve the history of their region's LGBTQ plus community including oral histories, diaries, photographs, and other memorabilia. The collecting of which has spent to Deb, or has led to Deb spending a lot of time in bars. And so that seems like a good place to turn things over to you, Deb. Thank you. Well, I guess I have to address the bar comment early on. It comes up later, but it, um, it epitomizes the concept of community archiving. So I'll get into that. So I'm honored to join you and to talk about a project that the whole UWGB archives team is incredibly passionate about. Um, and like Jennifer had indicated, I sort of envision myself as an archivist evangelist, which is a made up term that I created um, because I think it epitomizes or captures what I believe archives is about. We are not a dusty attic. We are not, you know, um, National Treasures, Indiana Jones kind of movie sets. We should be, and I want our archives specifically, to be about connecting the past, those historical materials to people. 
Um, you know, as library staff individuals, we all know that our library having everything on its shelves is really not a sign of a good library. We need to be more vibrant than that. So for me as an archivist, my vibrancy has to come from people are using our collections that you would never think about using our materials. So that's kind of a little bit about me and sort of um, why I might have gone down this path in this direction with our projects. So we think that the Our Voices project is really a, an example of community archiving, which by definition allows underrepresented or often overlooked individuals in society to identify, explore, celebrate their own communities, and I would add, preserve their own history. So oftentimes in an archive setting, the archivist is the one who is deciding what parts of history get saved and you know, like many collection development matters, there's art to that, there's science to that, but sometimes we might not know the right things to be saving, or we might miss things, or again, overlook. So we think our Our Voices project is a good example of community archiving at its basic principles. So for us, the beginning of our project was that we started out, another librarian and I, talking about working with UW Green Bay classes and wow, we could do these things with this class if only we had these materials. And we sort of said, well, wait, why are we not gathering those materials? If nobody's gathering them, let's do it ourselves. So that was a conversation centered around how can we reflect the LGBTQ story, so to speak. And we talked a lot about silent voices, which is for me something that our voice is absolutely trying to change that and not have silent voices. So we didn't get very far in that 2017 conversation, but some remnants were hung on to. And then I had a student employee working for me in 2019 and they were lamenting that they had to do their senior capstone project. And they, we're sick of papers. They had a really bad case of senioritis and I don't wanna do that. So I said, well, hey, would you consider doing like maybe an oral history interview? What would you like to do? So she was beyond excited about that and brought in another student colleague of hers. So in 2019, we sort of started our voices very unofficially. We didn't have the title. We didn't know we were going to make it last. We didn't know anything beyond, hey, we're doing this thing with these independent study with these two students. And that thing was chosen by them. They chose to interview four individuals, or it ended up being four individuals, and they focused on the coming out stories of those particular individuals. The students were... Um, afraid, nervous, anxious, but they also came to recognize at the end of the project, the power of the project, the power of hearing that voice, the honor of recording that person's voice and knowing that their story would be saved somehow. So I knew at that point, like, oh, well, what can we do? It's how do we make this keep going? We did learn some lessons, um, one of which was if we only focus on a specific narrow um, thread of a story like coming out that we will miss a whole lot more. Um, the students knew, learned that they should always be ready to pivot during the interview um, in that the first person they interviewed clearly came with a story they wanted to tell, but we wanted to focus on coming out. The story this individual wanted to tell was of their husband's recent mental health decline and subsequent suicide. The students weren't prepared for that. So, um, but we asked the question, is there anything else you'd like to share? And it's one of our most powerful interviews in terms of um, understanding that individual's experience. So in 2020, um, we launched a faculty member and I, a class called LGBTQ plus archives workshop. Now we thought we'd attract women's studies people, we thought students, we thought we'd attract history majors, maybe some humanities, but we did not attract any of those students with our class. Instead, we were working with um, psych students, sociology, political science, and so on, which is a whole, opens up a, I guess, a gamut that shows the spectrum that's possible within these courses. Um, some of the students struggled with us because we were like, well, 
it's history. There's no answer. You know, you have to interpret things. And they were like, but just what's the answer? I'm a psych major. So it was an interesting experience with um, those beginnings. And since then, we have done that class um, twice, maybe three times. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the undergraduates in a minute. But that is the beginning of our voices, if you would. So if we can move to the next slide. So in the very beginning of our project, we were focused on, well, we're doing these oral history interviews. And at the same time, as we begin to interact with individuals surrounding the oral history project, we were approached and asked to serve as a archives for two local advocacy groups um, that support and advocate for LGBTQ plus history, one Positive Voice and one Rainbow Over Wisconsin. Um, prior to their request, records had been stored in individuals' homes. They had been stored in unheated warehouses. Part of their impetus for asking us to um, serve as an archives was that they used to display materials, um, and some of them are on your screen, at Pride Fest. And then, sadly, they were being stolen um, from Pride Fest goers. So they were looking for a way to provide more security for their materials. So we agreed to serve as their archives. And one of the things that's come to us that's asked us to switch our ways of thinking about archives and move away from some traditional principles, and you'll see examples on the screen there. Those of you who might have familiarity with archives or intersected with archives know that they pretty much are um, traditional in terms of what they collect, meaning it's about paper, it's about text, it's about um, photographs, it's about, in some cases, recordings, um, media, et cetera. It's not about matchbooks, which there's a couple on the screen. It's not about a bar glass. It's not about, uh, let's see, I think we're up to five bankers boxes of t-shirts right now. So it's not about t-shirts generally. So one of the things that happened as we started this community archiving, the component that dealt with materials or stuff was we had to change how we looked at what we were going to collect. Um, we are collecting more at the item level we're finding rather than at the collection level. There's a lot more ephemera rather than here's somebody's diary or here's a collection of letters. So that has been one of the shifts that we've had to make as we attempt to um, help do this community archiving. It's been a lot of fun and interesting kinds of things. Um, you know, the library administration is asking me, why are you buying an acid-free glove box? Why do you have gloves in the archives? And it's really not gloves, it's to store that Miss Guernsey sash that's on the slide there. So, you know, and how does an archives preserve the leather poster that's on the slide from Argonaut? Argonaut, so an interesting way in a new way and a good challenge for us, but we are happy to do it. And then we can move to our next slide. So in addition to those collections that we have coming in, the a big heart of the Our Voices project is actually the concept of oral history interviews and the work surrounding that. Like I mentioned, it began with the independent study project with the two students um, who achieved four interviews in a semester. And then we moved to the LGBTQ plus archives workshop. And I think that semester we might've had 16 students involved. Not everybody was comfortable doing an oral history interview. That semester we gave them an option. So some did um, work in the archives. They did some research projects. They did some collection analysis and so on. But the bulk of them did interviews. Those who were doing the interviews um, enjoyed it so much that they begged us to let them do an independent study. So the following spring, six more continued and doing more interviews. Um, from that class, we sort of branched into a class called Queering Multicultural Narratives, which is taught in our English department. Um, it started out that the professor heard about our interviews and they asked us, well, can you share a couple that might be multicultural or BIPOC? And I said, this is my archive business evangelist, well, if your class is called narratives, oral histories are the best narratives that there are, would you consider having your students do oral history interviews? Now, in my mind, I'm thinking next time you teach the class, but um, this faculty member said, yes, let's do it. Can you come to the class next week? Let's do it. So that variation of the class was last spring for the first time. 
and we were able to produce 16 interviews. Um, amazing work. So those two classes are ongoing, one in the spring, one in the fall, and we plan on continuing that for the next years. We also added in another class called Introduction to Digital and Public Humanities, in which they used the collections last semester to digitally present projects based on, or public facing projects based on the collections. So one of the students did this amazing project on um, looking at um, bar logos and bar, bar face type and advertising materials. And they tried to look at what were the messages or commonalities or differences. And they were able to notice some things that I had totally missed um, about some of the bar logos and the symbolism. And that's presented in a digital project then on the internet. So a little bit more about oral histories. You're seeing some numbers that I put together for you. Um, we have interviewed 38 individuals in terms of student interviews. There might be 42, 43 um, interviews that are done a couple by other people. The five different class sections have tackled the interviewing. Um, we talk about within the classes that for LGBTQ archiving, I guess is the best way to describe it, we would be considered a rural collection. Now, most people in Green Bay don't like me to call Northeastern Wisconsin or certainly not Green Bay rural, but in the scheme of life, we're not San Francisco, we're not New York, we're not Chicago, we're not Madison, we're not Milwaukee. So we are uniquely positioned, we believe, to capture the, if you will, rural LGBTQ story, um, which we can see that happening. We can see individuals talking about their experiences. Um, students who go in and interview somebody who's of a certain age expect to say to them, tell me everything that happened at Stonewall and what you were thinking while it was happening. And everybody of that age who's from Northeastern Wisconsin, when that question is asked, they say, oh, we didn't know. So I think it captures then the essence of the stories. Um, we work really hard to interview individuals across different um, identifications and ages and experiences and so on. Sometimes that's been frustrating for the students. They often say to us, well, but we need to see ourselves there. We need to see ourselves in the collection, which we agree, but there's also only so much that we can do within our geographic definition. So there's some challenges there. Um, this is also one of the few collections I think that's supported and built basically on undergraduate student work. Typically this kind of work would be done by graduate students or professional oral historians. So we basically are training 16, 17 students every semester on how to go out and conduct oral history interviews. Um, it leads to some interesting philosophical conversations within the classes. Um, for example, one might be around language and the students are wanting to ask questions like, tell me when did you first understand yourself to be queer? Um, tell me when you first realized your authentic self. So we have to have conversations about why that might not be the best word choice for an interview. So an example of queer, the students are kind of upset usually about that one when I say no queer, don't ask a queer question like that. Um, but then we have the conversation in the 1970s, 1980s, a person who you're interviewing in their 1950s, queer was derogatory. So you're gonna take them right back to junior high and being slammed into lockers and so on. So you need to adjust your language based on your audience. Um, I think all of us in the library archives profession like to believe every day we come to work, we're making, a dif we're making a difference and we are, and we're making an impact. But sometimes I think we don't always know immediately. We don't always have an instant return on that um, wish or goal that we're trying to achieve. We know, especially in the archives, what we're saving is for the future. We won't even be here necessarily to see it be used. But in this project with those oral history interviews, we can already see that we're making a profound impact. And the impact is coming in a two-way street, right? It is coming from the students being impacted. They understand, oh, when I interview my 61-year-old, if it weren't for them and their experiences, I might not be here. And vice versa, the, um, the impact on the person being interviewed is, 
I am able to share my story. I am able to be heard. Quite regularly, when we ask people to participate, um, we receive back, I am humbled to be able to participate. I am honored to be able to participate. Um, so we know that those oral history interviews are making an impact and we are grateful for that. Next slide. So here is what Jen was alluding to, um, the bar scene. So in the true spirit of community archiving concept, we take our project on the road. And the first on the road trip we made was during COVID. And we were asked, could we please come to Napoli's Lounge, which you'll see us there on the slide, um, second oldest gay bar in the state. And we had some photo albums. And what if you came to the bar and we asked people to identify photos? So you have to remember, first of all, it's during COVID. My staff and I walked in on masks. We took with masks. We took one look around and said, oh, not the appropriate setting to be wearing our masks. So we all mutually decided to take them off. Afterwards, we joked and said, now what would that be if we had to do our UW system COVID-19 report? Oh, I was at Napoli's Lounge on staff time and contracted COVID. So that's kind of like, oh. um, so we had to be appreciative of the setting that we were in, which was their community room, um, not a whole lot of light. You'll see on your left on the slide, um, most of our photographs are spread out on a pool table. Um, those of you who might know things about archives, we're all about wear your gloves if you're touching our photographs. Um, no gloves in a bar would be appropriate. So we literally had to shift our perception of what we were doing. So we came to um, appreciate at one point by the end of the first night, my staff is sitting on the bar on the pool table to help identify photographs. Um, you know, the individuals are there with a glass of beer in their hand over the photographs. Again, major archives, no, no. Um, we were asked like, oh, can I just take this photo? And again, we're like, what? Like, oh, I think this is that guy sitting out on the bar stool. I'm just gonna go see if it's him. People asked us, could we take your photo? Could we take a copy of this photo or snap it with their phone? And we're like, sure, why? Oh, I used to date this person. It was my first par partner. I wanna show them how good they used to look. Um, you know, and more and more it was like messages, like you need to come down here and look at these photos. So we've developed quite a following at Napoli's Lounge. We're called, I'm called the Archives Lady. Um, so that's a new title. And amazing things happen there as well. Individuals who have never spoken about their past come forward, they start telling us little bits of stories, little pieces, they bring us photos, they bring us um, bar memorabilia, et cetera. And we've really developed a following, a community there. And then the other photograph that you see is um, Pride Fest. So we were asked to take over all of the responsibility for providing a historical context to pride. So it used to be a, one or two people did it and we were asked to instead create the display, which was very different from what they had ever seen um, and to bring that and staff it and be present. I think it took a lot of the staff outside of our instinctive comfort zone in that we had to be able to approach the individuals as they were looking at the exhibit to share more of the story, to ask them if they want to participate or learn more about it. And one of the elements that we take with us in this exhibit is a, a smaller section of the exhibit called Your Voice, in which people are invited to tell their own story, whatever they want it to be. It's just you know a handwritten thing. Um, we're looking at making that digitally available now instead. And it's give us a snip of something you wanna talk about. So we've done that at two or three different venues now. Probably my most moving story is a young person was there with an adult and had picked up the paper to write their story. And I walked over and they said, I don't know what to write. And I said, well, write what you're feeling, write what happens at school, you know, write your feelings. And they drew a stick figure of themselves. And then they wrote, I'm glad I finally know who I am and I feel better at school now. And then they signed their name zero. And that was an 11 year old who gave us their voice then. So all of those are being saved and added to the archives as well. Um, we did a similar event um, at, at our Performing Arts Center and it was called Hollow Queen and it was a drag show. 
And there were 400, 500 people in attendance and we had the display there and amazing experiences again because of that and amazing contacts. So if we can go to the next slide. So what's next? And we were trying to control our list and it just kept growing as we were preparing this slide. Um, overall, I'm gonna talk just a little bit and then we'll talk about some of these bullets. I think what's next for us is to continue learning and to continue this community archiving. It does come with some heavy lifting at time. Um, there's a lot of philosophical conversations. Um, if we change an oral history interview, if we um, summarize it or transcribe it, are we being true to the interview? Trust is a huge issue. Um, there have been some who have questioned us, are we the right people to be doing this? Um, should we be doing it? So it is community with a capital C. We're always out there. We're always gaining more and more connections. We think that we see opportunities everywhere. And that's what you see here on the slide. So we're going to be doing some more interviewing. We'll be doing 17 in a class this semester. Our goal is to create a landing page in our UW-Green Bay digital collections where this will become fully searchable. The transcripts will become searchable and the sound files would be there as well. I have a vision that I wanna expand which courses are involved in it. I think it would lend itself well to the tech writing course and the editing course. So there's some tasks that they might be able to do for us. We've been approached by a local script writer and a theatrical troupe who wants to produce an original script based on the oral history interviews. We're collaborating with the Neville Public Museum um, for a year long exhibit. And um, that is something brand new for the Neville Museum and the exhibit will be based almost 95% on the oral history voices and the work we've been doing to gather the local history. Um, we've been asked to present at or to be present with the exhibit at the K through 12 educator conference coming in a month or so. Um, I'm excited about the GSA. Um, Green Bay School District received funding to bring 200 GSA middle school and high school youth to campus. And they again have asked us to bring our display and we're going to be gathering those your voices again. So we're really excited by the idea that these GSA youth will share their voice and their experience with us. We um, are part of a consortium of local history organizations and we're all coming together one week and we're gonna do these history days. And so we just wanted to be outside of the box. And we said, hey, let's do a local drag history panel instead of a like, how do you care for your photographs panel? Um, so the local drag history panel, our vision is that we are featuring local drag queens and kings. Um, let's see if I can say this appropriately. They would say it themselves the old guy, old people and newer. And so we want to have them share their experiences and what's the same and what's the difference. And it, I think it should be pretty cool. Um, we are working some, with some statewide cultural organizations. Wisconsin Public Television has a new documentary coming out in June called Wisconsin Pride. And we're involved with um, them and thinking about some screenings locally. And then we've also been approached by Wisconsin Historical Society, their new museum that's being created um, in Madison to see how we can incorporate some of these voices into their permanent exhibit. And of course, we'll be doing more photo ID nights, more Pride Fest, and so on. So it's a lot of stuff going on, but we are excited about it. So I can pause there and we can come out of the slideshow if you want, and I can take questions that might be appearing. Wow, thank you so much, Deb. Um, we are just, you know, I'm gonna echo what's coming through on the chat here and I encourage everyone, if you have questions, please add them to the chat. We've got some time with Deb um, to learn more about really um, what an incredibly diverse, like, I mean, your project, since I've heard, since I heard you speak last about it has grown and amplified. I mean, it's just taking on a life of its own. And I'm sure it's, it's taking a lot of your time. It's wonderful. So we have a thank you for your outstanding work on this project in the chat, impressive, important work. Not only are you preserving important voices, but saving lives. Um, 
there is a question um, about sort of, let's see here, um, curious about two sides of the same question. So the um, community response. So what, how is green, how, what are you hearing from Green Bay residents um, that's positive or affirming or pushback or negative? Sort of what is the local, you know, talk about this being such a localized collection. What's that local response looking like? So we, from the community perspective, um, to my knowledge, we have not had any um, concerning or negative feedback um, in terms of our leading on this and so on. If I have to say something that they that the community might be concerned about, it is like, hurry up. I met you at this photo ID night and I said I'd be interviewed and it's a month later and you haven't interviewed me yet. So there's um, that concern, I think, as well. I think one of the things that we learned very quickly on was the concept, and it's not a new concept, right? But it's a vitally important concept in this community archiving, which is trust. So we work with the student interviews, like you can't go in with a preconceived idea. You can't assume that everybody knew about Stonewall in 1969. Um, you have to be ready to let their story go where their story is wants to go or where they want their story to go. Um, so we talk about, so the community response, I would say, has been very good. And it's, it's again, unlike any archive collecting that I've done in that the things come in a piecemeal fashion. So, you know, somebody will bring in a matchbook that they have kept for 20 years or 30 years, and it's their, you know, their matchbook of their first bar they went to, which is where they realized or came out to themselves or whatever it might be. And they literally will come in with that matchbook in their hand and as if they were giving me a brick of gold um, to release this and to share it with us. Um, probably one of the most moving stories was during a photo ID night, a woman came in sobbing, clearly crying from the get-go. She had an Amazon unremarkable box in her hand. And she approached the pool table and she said, I need to give you this. So I stepped over to have a conversation and I said, well, tell me more. And she's crying. And she said, I need to give you this for Jennifer. And Jennifer was her partner who had passed away a number of years ago. And she said, I need Jennifer's life and story to continue. I need to give this to you. And so that is an incredibly moving type of experience where you see that people are just literally entrusting you with their heart, their soul, their experience, and so on. And we are hearing very intimate stories of a lot of people. And I am proud of our UW Green Bay students who go in and they do these interviews and they conduct themselves professionally um, you know, like I said, they were not prepared for the suicide of the partner. They were not prepared to hear, you know, I went back in the closet after a police officer rapped on my car window with his night billy stick and threatened to tell my family that I was making out with my first crush. Um, so the students aren't prepared to hear those stories in some ways, but they also do like an amazing job. And they push us in ways we may or may not have pushed ourselves. They push us sooner than we might be ready to be pushed as the professionals. Um, so that kind of thing is another challenge for us, but it's good, it's good, we need to be pushed. Deb, another question that came through was about um, ethical implications about you know outing someone or sharing dead names if you're working with um, you know, the trans community, things, you know, how have you had to change either protocols or your, the way you might approach something in light of, of the, the material and content of this collection? Good question. So we've had many, many ethical principle conversations. We've dug and dug and dug in looking at oral history guidelines by big institutions who are the lead in the nation for that. Um, because we have had to think about many different questions like you're talking about. We start out the interviewing project in particular 
with asking individuals to complete a biographical form. So we gather what pronouns do you want to use? What names do you want to use? We make sure that they understand these are the kinds of questions we're going to ask you. We make sure that they understand if there's a question you don't want to answer, you can say pass. Um, you can ask to turn off a recorder. The in, people that we've interviewed at the end, we always ask them, are there any other individuals that you think we should interview? Most are very mindful of privacy and will say to us, I'm going to check and I will get back with you. So they never say on the recording, oh, you should interview John Doe um, without you know, giving getting John Doe's permission. So they're very, very super mindful of that. I think the other ethics questions that we've had to wrestle with, which I did not anticipate truthfully, um, speak more to collection development parameters, if you would. So we've taken a position in my other day job, so to speak here, that we don't do artifacts in an archives. Well, if I didn't allow us to do artifacts with our voices, we wouldn't have the Miss Guernsey story, Miss Guernsey Gala story, which is a whole complicated thing. You know, we wouldn't have some of the bar ephemera, which is the only way to know that history, which is a safe haven space. So we've had to adjust our collection development policy. Um, interestingly, when you asked me the earlier question about the community and how they've responded, it's been an interesting conversation um, because when we were given three, four boxes of photo albums for 15 years of one of the local bars, they're mostly unidentified. They're very um, explicit photographs of bars and bar activities in the 1980s. So then we've had interesting conversations. Members of the LGBTQ plus local community who helped arrange the donation felt that we should sanitize the collection. That's our word, not theirs. Um, sanitize the collection and remove all of the risque explicit photographs. And their concern was, well, kids might see these. And I said, well, I'm not exactly putting those kind of photographs in a digital collection online per se, or we haven't thought that far yet. But I think, um, so, you know, that particular individual was one of our go-betweens for a different donation and they removed all the risque photos out of the collection before they gave it to us. And we're like, mm, we'd like to have those risque photos in there because it is part of the bar culture. It is part of the 1980s scene. So that's one of the ethical things that we've had to deal with. Um, let's see what else. When the script writer first approached us, uh, we were in the middle of teaching a class and I mentioned it. And those of you who know me, I'm like, yeah, cool. Um, a unique use of the archives. And what ended up happening is the students had a very um, strong reaction and it was not a positive reaction about a script writer using the materials. So in that case, we had to talk about, well, wait, an archives is about access. And isn't this why you're doing this interview? So people can hear these stories. Well, but yes, we didn't, we don't want that person to use the interviews. And I'm like, mm. and archives does, archives and libraries never ask why you want something. And if I had a bigger staff, this would already be on the web and we wouldn't be knowing, we wouldn't know what that person is doing. So we had those kinds of ethical conversations. I don't know if that gets at, I saw it was Jeff who asked that question, um, sort of rambling here. So I hope that addressed what you were talking about. But lots of different things that we've had to address. Yeah, no, Jeff, Jeff said that was great. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And this is about the um, um, either the preparation you're doing now or maybe the evolution of how you've helped prepare students for taking the interviews. I mean, when you think about how you describe the origin of this project, which was sort of, you know, have you thought of doing some oral interviews to now? Um, I'm sure there's been some changes there. How are you getting students prepared um, to engage in this kind of activity? So what we do with the students currently, and it, it is definitely an evolution. I think we tweak something almost every semester between the classes that we work with. So the evolution has sort of become, um, we used to put all the responsibility on the students to make the initial contacts. Um, we don't do that anymore because they have five other classes that they're taking. So they might not be on top of that. So we sort of, um, navigate and work on the contacts ourselves. So we'll we'll gather names for them to interview. We generally know something about them. We used to do it as a process where like, hey, whatever, here's a bunch of people to interview. Which one do you want? 
We try to be a little bit more um, careful about that now. So we'll know a little bit about the person who's agreeing to be interviewed. And then we'll ask the students, you know, do any of these resonate with you? Are these any, uh, any of these that you don't want to do? Like we had a LGBTQ plus pastor who was on our interview list last semester. And so we had students who say, I do not want to have anything to do with religion or religious undertones or overtones or anything. So please don't have me interview that person. You know, we had some other student who said, I am really into makeup and artistry. You know, I don't know how I could do an interview. Well, we were excited because we found somebody who was the makeup artist for the local drag queens and would go on the pageant circuit with them. It's an amazing interview, just like phenomenal. So we try to be more mindful of how we match students. Um, then I and the professor work with the students. So they have some oral history readings. They generate some questions. As a class, we talk about what makes good questions, what makes bad questions. They do practice interviews with each other, which is low stakes then. Um, and then we, I coach them all along the way. I review their questions before they go out. So we have some standard questions and some questions that um, you know might be customized to a drag queen or to a LGBTQ business owner or whatever. So we work together in um, true partnership, the faculty member and the students. So it gets this one team. And that's our goal that semester is to generate the best interviews that we can. And I would say out of all the interviews that we've done, maybe two were not the best because it was a student doing the interview. Maybe two were not the best that they could have been, but they still captured stories that we don't have anywhere, any other way. So it's awesome, it's amazing. I am honored to be part of this. I never expected to have this become a career element, um, but we are just incredibly honored to have been entrusted with this sort of archives evangelism, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. I mean, I'm really struck by um, how we, you know, we had the theme of breaking down barriers and you've just sort of showed us this like kind of onion layers of peeling back all these barriers, both for the students, um, as you mentioned, getting to engage in conducting oral histories at an undergraduate level, to archivists learning to kind of lay some of your tried and true institutional ways of doing things at the door to accommodate this work, to obviously the, the barrier being reduced for you know, broadening this information to a broader community. So thank you so much for sharing that story. We really- Thank really you for asking. It. Yeah, thank you. Well, we will move on then to our next speaker who unfortunately um, in advance we knew couldn't be here today. So what um, she has done is uh, put together a brief presentation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kelly Hughes-Jones, reference librarian at Waukesha County Technical College. Um, her project that she will be sharing on, which is called Walking in Community, was a recipient um, of our Ideas to Action grant program here at Wills and a side note, um, if you are unfamiliar with um, what Ideas to Action is, we're going to be covering that later on in our Wills update. So stick around for that piece and you can learn how you can participate in Ideas to Action. Um, the, the program that uh, Dr. Jones will be sharing with us is a research-based virtual wellness and spirituality project geared toward uniting BIPOC librarians across disciplines throughout Wisconsin and across the U.S. So we will um, share a brief video with you now from Dr. Hughes-Jones. Hello, my name is Dr. Kel Hughes-Jones and I am a librarian at Waukesha County Technical College. Today I'll be talking to you about the Walking in Community Project funded by Wills. I hope partner in this project is Amanda M. Lefkowitz, Student Success Librarian at Montgomery Co County Community College in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. The purpose of our project was one, we wanted to be able to create a safe space for librarians of color. Um, there's a lot of research that talks about the need for retaining 
librarians of color as, as well as recruiting librarians of color. And one way to do this is creating a space where um, individuals feel free to talk or share or be with like-minded people or individuals who've had similar experiences. Also, there is a lot of research going around about the benefits of using wellness and spirituality in either one's personal life or incorporating it into the workplace. And so we wanted to focus on how to do this in a library setting. So we wanted to advocate the benefits of wellness and spirituality. Lastly, this project not only is um, creating this space, but we do have a research element to it. So we wanted to be able to contribute some research and scholarship to the library profession. So in short, our plan was to create a wellness group and then from there have four targeted sessions. Our first session was a kickoff event with Dasha Kelly Hamilton, who is the Wisconsin Poet Laureate. From there, we had a session at the beginning of February around self-care and wellness. And Amanda did a presentation about self-care and wellness. She also teaches on Library Juice Academy. In March, I'm going to do a session related to thriving. And then in April, we are going to do a session about release and meditation. And our timeline has been as follows in the fall. We sent out registration information to different listservs and tried to um, get the applicants involved. We also created a survey. Um, in November, we had our kickoff event with Dasha, our poet laureate of Wisconsin. And then from there, in the, in, after that event, um, we kind of went through who attended and we had a survey where we um, we borrowed a spiritual spirituality um, on the job type of survey and was looking to see how people are incorporating spiritual elements at work. And then after that, um, we had some open ended questions as well to see how the how individuals are dealing with microaggressions, um, race based incidents at work. And again, we were just trying to see um, you know, are people incorporating wellness and spiritual practices to help them navigate the workplace as people of color? Um, then, like I said, in February, we had our first, heal, we call it a healing circle or, or wellness event or, or, you know, our small group. And we are recording the audio so we can go back and transcribe it and um, analyze that data. And then I already explained the other two healing circles that we have. And then our goal is that over the summer, we'll take the time to analyze the results from the survey and the circles, um, and then begin to publish from there, either through conferences and as well as doing writing. We had our event uh, was, this is a flyer from the event that Will's created for us, um, our kickoff event, and we had about roughly about 50 people who showed up. We had 150 register and then 50 showed up and because of the time limit, some people came in and out. Um, so now with our other, our smaller groups, we've had about 16 registered and then half of that showed up. So it's actually worked out pretty well that the, the group is kind of small because I think that will establish a lot of trust. So far the feedback that we've gotten so we did do a follow-up survey after our event in November um, that the experience was enjoyable and valuable. Um, we have gotten some constructive criticism about time, making sure that either we start on time or make sure that um, the event isn't too long so that people have time to attend um, and fit it into their schedule and you know complete the whole thing. And then also people actually from our November event stated that they wanted really clear takeaways. So that's why with our three smaller focus groups that we've been having, we, Amanda and I have been really sure, really focused on making sure that when people leave, they have something that they can walk away and do. 
And lastly, we just wanted to say thank you to Wills for um, this grant. We, this is something we wanted to do for a long time and also thank you for this opportunity. So I'll thank Kel for sharing that recording. And um, obviously, if you have questions that we can pass her way, um, throw those in the chat, or you can um, contact her directly. Her email was just put into the chat there. Um, she welcomes any of those questions. Same for Deb. If you have other things that you didn't get to ask, by all means, um, pass those along, and we will make sure they get to the right person. So we would like to now take some time to hear from you. We know that these stories are not the only um, ways in which libraries and cultural organizations are breaking down barriers across the state. And we wanna know how you are doing this in your own way, small or big. How are you reaching out? How are you pushing past, inviting in or shifting your own outlooks to break down obstacles? The way you can do this is just follow the QR code or the URL on the, in the chat or on the slide. And we're gonna just take a moment to let you, all you have to do is type in a phrase or a word um, that just sort of represents what you're doing in your own organization so that we can see all the great work happening at our member, at our member orgs. And I think we're going to in a moment, there we go. We're gonna to go to a screen while you're start, where we will start to see those answers coming in. Thank you for sharing. Please keep bringing those in. I'm gonna start talking about a few of these. We're seeing libraries and cultural organizations making TikTok, certainly speaking to new audiences and reaching out to, to people in unexpected ways. Opening the library on evenings and weekends to bring families and communities together. Conversation cafes, where we're bringing folks together to to learn from each other and to, to share. Diversifying staff and seeing attendance at branches in diverse neighborhoods rise. When people see and are served by people who look like them, who come from similar backgrounds, that's really important, isn't it? Find free libraries, removing the barrier of, of um, of the traditional fine. And, and uh, cataloging, right? How we describe the collections and being more inclusive in how we, how we use our metadata. Digital resources reaching beyond the walls of our organization, establishing affinity groups, working with the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Well, we're gonna let you keep on adding in there. We'll share this again at the end and see what's all come in and, and maybe there's some inspiration there for your colleagues. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. We're gonna go into um, just briefly talking about some of the work that Wills is doing or what we're planning on doing soon in the coming year that is re in response to the needs that we're hearing from you. Um, developing your expertise about your communities through data, helping you save time and money, cultivating communities who work together to solve problems and giving you resources to kickstart new ideas. So I'm gonna turn things over to Melody Clark um, who's graciously stepping in for our data analyst, Kim Keysweater, 
who couldn't join us this morning. Like I said, it has been a week. Um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Melody to talk about the growth in our data services. Thanks, Melody. Thanks, Jen. All right, so um, it has been great to hear from everyone so far. Building on the theme of reducing barriers and expanding access, Wills has a brief update about an area of service growth over the past year, which is our offerings related to research and data services. <clears throat> As Jen mentioned, um, I am not the image you see on your screen. <laughs> I am Melody Clark, another Willsian, stepping in for my colleague, Kim Keyswitter, who um, unfortunately is not able to be with us this morning, but has had the pleasure of meeting many of you already. But for those of you who don't know Kim, she started at Wills in 2020. What a great time to uh, start at a new organization. <laughs> but she started um, then as our data analyst, and she's worked primarily on the consulting team doing a variety of data work, uh, data related work. But she also jumps in um, in other Wills teams as needed to help with all things data related. She doesn't come from a library background, so her early time at Wills was have, um, heavily on, spent learning about um, libraries and connecting with folks within the library community in Wisconsin and um, providing data support, <clears throat> excuse me, providing supporting data work on existing consulting services we provide, especially strategic planning. Over the past three years, this has evolved considerably to include more standalone data-oriented projects, ranging from offering customized data training to individual libraries and cohorts to working collaboratively on statewide research endeavors. Um, they, the consulting team, and um, especially Kim, has had a few big areas of growth in this realm over the past year. First up in 2022, so last year, Kim served as the interim state data coordinator, which is um, the SDC. <laughs> it's um, the state data coordinator it, to the Institute for Museum and Library Services, or the IMLS, for DPI during a hiring transition that they had last year. So that meant she managed the statewide annual report data collection effort for the public libraries across Wisconsin. This was a growth opportunity for her in many ways. Having worked for a couple of years prior using annual report data in Will's consulting work, serving as the SDC allowed her to really understand the process more fully and feel increasingly confident about the data itself, what it means and how it can be better leveraged to serve public libraries, while of course also meeting federal reporting requirements. <clears throat> From this experience, she saw a clear need for two things. One, better access to more visualized and annual report data for the public library staff, and two, the ability to make clear, easy, and meaningful comparisons with statistically sound peer libraries to help inform growth and decision-making at the library level. So during um, 2020, in support of Will's consulting work, she turned our annual report data work into a more interactive dashboard and integrated data from all the way from 2015 to 2021 on dozens of identified annual report metrics. We have been using the dashboard in predominantly strategic planning work, but recently soft launch expanding dashboards access to any public library in Wisconsin included in the annual report throughout an annual subscription service. So that's been very exciting. Um, second is, in addition to the annual report data work, Wills has continued to partner with different organizations to conduct more customized library research work that requires um, more data collection, uh, analysis, and visual visualization. Over the past year, this has included Kim partnering with Melissa and Jen with the City Library Collective on a large scale ARPA funded project that involves significant data collection and reporting through an evaluation lens on whole person librarianship initiatives across participating libraries. Being selected to manage the research and writing process on a number of LSTA funded statewide projects, including one on board engagement and another on public library staff training and use called the Data Landscape Project and partnering with multiple public library systems on LSTA projects that involve heavy data collection, analysis, and reporting on a variety of topics. 
And then finally, <clears throat> they've made sure to turn inwards too. So Kim and the consulting team have helped with different research and data related efforts to help create Will's own strategic plan and have also taken the time to ensure that each service area here at Wells has their data needs met, whether that's simply checking in to talk about anything data related going on in that service area or helping the team design a process and instrument for regular data collection. The co-op team has just launched a survey they created and we'll get to hear from almost 200 partners about their experiences and hopes for the future. So that's just one example of what we've been up to. So now I'll turn it over to Jeff to share a little bit more about uh, what else cooperative purchasing is working on. Thank you, uh, Melody. Let me get my script back up here. Um, I'm Jeff Pruner, the cooperative purchasing manager at Wills. And since I've got the camera for a minute, I'm going to take a brief moment to say what a thrill it has been to share screen time with Deb Anderson, who spoke earlier about our, our her uh, Our Voices project. Deb actually gave me my very first job in libraries <clears throat> when I was a student at UW-Green Bay, uh, at, I believe at the tender age of 19. <laughs> so I can't imagine what my career would have turned out to be if I hadn't met Deb. So thank you very much, Deb. Okay, anyway, um, the cooperative purchasing team is very excited about 2023. We've got an ambitious slate of projects. All of them are aimed at improving the service for our members. Um, and honestly, there isn't enough time for me to cover everything. So I picked three that we're particularly excited about. Uh, first up uh, is our new K-12 My Wills Orientation Toolkit. Um, we all know that there's a lot to learn when you're starting a new job. Um, we've also seen that there is substantial turnover in the library media specialists among our K-12 members. Uh, it can take a while to get up to speed on all of the procedures and responsibilities, and Wills wants to uh, help with that. So our goal is to make it easy to work with us. Um, so we're putting together an orientation toolkit for new um, library media specialists. The toolkit will cover several topics, including an overview of Wills services, um, how to use our My Wills interface. Uh, it'll offer helpful links to our vendor and product catalogs and other website features. Uh, we'll also include a summary of the library or district's current subscriptions, tips on how to get usage data, and um, how to set your invoice preferences with Wills. We'll wrap up with additional information about the Common School Fund generally, um, our Ideas to Action Fund, the WSDLC, and all kinds of other resources for a new uh, library media specialist. Um, the toolkit is still in development, but we expect to roll it out in the spring. Uh, it's being written with uh, from the position of being helpful to somebody new in the, in the profession or in a particular role, but we think it will be valuable for any of our uh, members, certainly K-12 members, but actually I think it might be valuable to any Wills uh, member uh, who works with us for cooperative purchasing. <clears throat> the next thing I'm gonna talk about isn't really a new service, but it's something that not many of our members really know about, uh, which is our bill pay service. So with bill pay, members can actually send any invoices to wills to handle even if it's not something you ordered through wills so if you've got direct purchases you can arrange to have wills pay the invoices on your behalf then we can roll all of those charges into a single invoice to you or we can spread those invoices out on a timeline that works for you so some members have used it as a means to increase capacity in the library or for the accounts payable staff it can be a way to time shift the paying of your bills as well for instance, if your library needs to buy something now, but you won't have the budget until after the new fiscal year, we can help with that. Um, we'll pay the invoice immediately and then charge you when your new funds are available at the start of the new fiscal. Uh, bill pay also works with deposit accounts. So uh, I've talked about deposit accounts before, but this is a, a means where we can uh, send you an invoice annually or, or on some other frequency to just put money on account with wills. And then you could send your in vendor invoices to us and we'll pay the vendor and just debit the money from the deposit account. 
So I guess the the bottom line is Wills has a uh, bottom line. That's pretty funny. Uh, has a uh, a lot of ways to kind of help our member libraries um, with financial management. It can uh, some of the libraries that are using Bill Pay use it a lot and have found it to be really helpful to just get uh, the occasional invoice from Wills, uh, and Wills will pay out all of those invoices to uh, to vendors uh, much more rapidly. And finally, uh, more tacos. So one popular offering from the Quad Purchasing team is Taco Tuesday. Um, those are a series of one hour webinars. And for each session, we invite four of our vendor partners to each give a 15 minute talk about some product or feature that they're excited about. It's a great way to learn about new resources at your library uh, or for your library, I guess. Um, and if you can't make it live, we record all of the sessions. We even, we provide a recording to the full session, but we also break it down by segments. So if there was just one vendor you were really looking forward to seeing, but you couldn't make it, you could go right to the link for that vendor and just watch that segment. Um, all of those recordings live on our YouTube page, which I think is becoming a very robust video resource, um, in part because this year we have started doing Taco Tuesdays twice as often. <laughs> so uh, we opened up the extra slots uh, and vendors jumped at the opportunity to share with you. So um, we are now doing Taco Tuesdays uh, twice every month instead of once a month. Um, we actually booked all the vendor slots in a matter of hours. Uh, and so we're very excited about the slate of presenters we have. Registration for all of the sessions is ongoing. So uh, there's a Taco Tuesdays page on our website. Uh, you can register there, come and register for a session or maybe just register for all of them. <laughs> um, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, and finally, um, Melody mentioned this, this isn't on my slide, um, but uh, I will reiterate that um, the cooperative purchasing team just closed our annual feedback survey. So uh, Kim, who, uh, who would have been speaking before me if she was able to join us, um, is already working on analyzing those results. So the feedback that we've gotten from our members, and I didn't even realize it was like 200, which is amazing. Um, so that feedback's really gonna help us improve the service and set priorities and set our course for uh, future uh, endeavors and, and the future of, of what I think is a, a great service already. Uh, we wanna make it that much better. So thank you to everyone who uh, participated in the survey and thanks for listening to me. Uh, now I'll turn things over to Jen to share a little bit about um, how we are building and supporting communities within our membership. Thanks, Jeff. And you for sure have lots of people on this call thinking about lunch and more tacos. Um, so if you have glanced at our annual report or been reading our monthly communications, you know um, that strengthening and building community is really a focal point of Wills. It has been for years, but we are, we are making it um, kind of the, the highlight of our strategic plan. It's the top goal on our five-year plan because we're really um, excited about where this work um, is heading. So we could really not agree more with the, the quote that you see here on the screen. Um, that getting people together to work in the same direction is incredibly powerful. Plus, we see approaching work through communities of practice or cohorts as a key way of ensuring sustainability and longevity into a project. Um, because our five-year plan places community building as our top goal, we have really been working on enhancing both the existing collaborations that we're working with and looking at building new ways of combining people and channeling collective effort. So as project managers, um, we work with a handful of consortia, some of which are represented on the screen, and you probably recognize a few of them here. Um, while most of these consortia formed initially around a shared digital collection or a tool or a platform, we're seeing these communities starting to expand their definition of how they work together and finding new ways to leverage their collective expertise. This year, we are placing or planning, excuse me, an internal gathering of our consortium managers. So the people on the will side of the house that help um, facilitate these, these groups. 
we're going to be getting um, all of us together so we can share best practices and leverage our internal staff expertise and know-how on how to help our consortial partners um, work most efficiently and effectively and really achieve great results. So I guess we can kind of call this sort of our own community of practice of community practitioners. So that's something we're working on. Um, another exciting collaborative that we've been working with is the City Library Collective. And if you were at WLA in the fall, um, you, you may have caught this presentation, um, but this is a, a group that's facilitated primarily by my colleague, Melissa McClymans from the consulting team, although um, Kim and I both step in um, as needed to work with this group. And the CLC was formed in 2021 around a shared interest in working with libraries similar in size and scope. You can see the, the 11 mid-sized libraries represented here on this map. Um, and what they were, they came together because they were interested in addressing common concerns, pooling their knowledge, and incubating solutions for public libraries of their size. In 2022, they created a community resiliency toolkit based on integrating social worker concepts in the library. The toolkit offers training materials, templates, local project reports, um, as well as community data and analysis, all centered around positioning the library as a key community resiliency partner. Um, if you are interested in this toolkit and the resources contained, it's openly available at their website, citylibrarycollective.org. Um, as the C CLC enters its second full year, they've identified st uh, strengthening staff as something that they're gonna tackle together in 2023. So watch for that. Hopefully they'll be sharing out some of that information um, a little bit down the road. I can also offer you a little preview on a couple of projects we have in the works, um, which are continuing in the vein of communities of practice and community building. The first is um, a, an experience, a, an eight week cohort experience that our consulting team under the leadership of Laura Damon Moore, um, they're working on. And, and this is really focused on helping our members, particularly smaller organizations, navigate the, the challenges of knowledge transfer and turnover. Um, so for most of you probably listening today, you are well aware of, um, you know, the, the the disruption that staff turnover has, especially on a small organization with a small team and the loss of one person, particularly the administrator, can make it really challenging, not just only to keep basic services running, but also continue longer term goals and projects. Um, this leads to disruptions in everything from strategic planning to community engagement initiatives um, and programming. So through this experience, we hope we would help libraries and other cultural organizations document their work, prepare in advance for staff turnover, um, meaning that they can keep their momentum up, whether it's related to day-to-day -day operations or more future-facing initiatives. Mm -hmm. We're still gathering input from a few individuals, um, but hoping to launch this experience later this year. Um, the next project, uh, that we're, we're really in the very early stages of formulating is um, something right now we're calling the Native Nations Digital Records Collective. This is related to a project that um, Adrian was going to be sharing with you this morning, um, which is um, a, a multi-year collaboration that Wills has been um, working on with tribal archivists, librarians, and other cultural workers through something that you may have heard of. It's called the Mukutu Project. And we've been working on this in some fashion or form since about 2017. Up until now, this work has largely been um, supported through limited term grants. Um, and we're really interested at Wills in finding a way to um, continue this work ongoing in a more sustainable fashion. So, with support and direction from our board of directors, 
Um, we are, the Will staff is sort of sketching out a plan to bring um, an advisory board and some more formality around this group. Um, my colleague, Aaron Hughes, um, who's been engaged in this work for the past several years, will be leading that effort. And we hope we can really find a way to strengthen this established community network and continue supporting this valuable digital preservation with our tribal partners. So those are two things to look forward to. And I'm gonna pass things over now to Emily, who will tell you more about how Wills is giving back to members to help people bring good projects to life. Hi, uh, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm Emily Fotenhauer. Um, I'm part of the Wills team. I'm actually the last Willsian to give an update this morning. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit this morning about Wills' Ideas to Action Fund and how it benefits our member community. Um, so one of Wills' organizational values is that we believe we're all in this together. We work to connect members and provide opportunities for collaboration in order to grow and strengthen all parts of our ecosystem. And Wills believes that investing in individual organizations, good ideas can benefit the whole member community by fueling innovation and collaboration. So to live out that value, uh, starting in 2018, the Wills board launched what we've called the Ideas to Action Fund, uh, which is also our tagline. Um, this granting program aims to encourage partnerships and collaborations among Wills members and with their community partners um, to support innovative and exploratory new work and to be sort of a seed or an incubator uh, fund to seed the development of processes, methods, or resources that can be used by other Wills members. Since it got started in 2018, Ideas to Action has funded 38 projects from across the state um, and we really value the ability to reach all of our different member types and their community partners from all throughout the state. You can see the geographic reach of the fund in the map here on this slide, and the call out boxes are spotlighting our newest cycle of ideas to action projects, which were awarded in fall of 2020. Um, and those include the Walking in Community initiative that Dr. Kel Hughes Jones shared earlier, the advocacy toolkit currently in development by Northern Waters Library System, and oral history interviews that students are conducting with alumni of the School of Education at UW Platteville. So for all member types and all parts of the state, the Ideas to Action Fund is helping our members take on creative projects that meet the needs of their communities. So today I'm going to very briefly highlight just a few recent Ideas to Action projects to give you a sense of the big range of amazing things that our members are implementing. Um, so I've got a few slides just to highlight uh, quickly some of these projects. You can find more information about each of these projects as well as all the other um, 38 projects um, from the past several years on the Wills website. Um, so at Lakeland Union High School in Manaqua, um, science teacher Laura McCluskey and library media specialist Peg Billing recognized a need to build connections across the multiple elementary schools in their region and to prepare students in those schools for the larger unified high school environment. So they planned an interactive STEAM field day in the Lakeland Union High School forest where area fourth graders learned about nature from a cultural, cultural perspective through activities led by uh, the high school students. Um, over at Kimberly Public Library, uh, they recently completed this project to offer programming and exhibits in, ex in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. Um, they invited indigenous presenters, including the Ho-Chunk storyteller Andy Cloud, Oneida artist and storyteller Deborah Morningstar, and Oneida chef Arlie Doxtatter. Uh, using what they learned from these events, the library also built up their collection of works by contemporary Indigenous authors, and you can find that list of authors and titles on the Wills website. Um, let's see, another project that I'll highlight today comes from the Chilton Public Library. This was led by the library's assistant director, Rebecca Berry. And Chilton used their Ideas to Action Fund to respond to a specific patron need that they identified in their community, 
um, older adults who needed to gain comfort in online environments in order to stay in touch with others. Um, and this was a need, especially during the pandemic. Um, the library offered a series of basic technology workshops that they tailored to meet the needs of this audience. And again, we've got resources from this project available on the Wills website. So the handouts uh, that they created for each of the um, 12 lessons they offered have been posted to our website for others to reuse and adapt. Um, up north in Stanley, Wisconsin, the D.R. Moon Memorial Library used Ideas to Action funds to bring educational resources to rural Amish and Old Order Mennonite parochial and homeschools in their area. Um, because these rural populations are rarely able to reach the library, the goal, according to library director Elizabeth Miniat, was to bring the library to them. Uh, they started with just a few locations that wanted the curriculum packets that the library was offering, uh, but the number of participants is continuing to grow as teachers and parents build their trust in the program and are telling other rural schools and homeschools about it. And finally, my last ideas to action spotlight today is the Patterson Memorial Library in Wild Roads. And they borrowed from an innovative national model, which is uh, known as the Memory Lab, and adapted it to their library space. Library director Kent Barnard spearheaded the creation of what they call the Memory Spot, which is a dedicated space within the library where patrons can use specialized equipment to digitize home movies, old Kodak slides, and other family memories that are on obsolete media formats. So we are very excited to once again offer the Ideas to Action Fund in 2023. The application period this year will open on April 3rd. It's open for about two months. Um, and members can apply for up to $5,000. We'll be awarding a total of $35,000. And we've really strived uh, over the years to create a clear and simple process for uh, applying. Um, it's simply a Google form with um, or five questions. Uh, on our website, you can find some examples of successful past proposals to help shape your proposal. Uh, plus, we also have a recording of a webinar we provided last year that outlines some tips for developing a strong proposal. And the Wills Board is especially interested in supporting projects that um, might be small but mighty. Um, as we said, $5,000 is the maximum award amount, but there's no minimum request. Uh, sometimes just a small amount of funds are needed to try out a new idea. Uh, the Wills Board is also interested in projects that help our members reach underserved populations in their communities and supporting projects in parts of the state that we haven't previously reached, in particular in the North Woods and in the Southwest. Um, so look to our website for the opening of the application period. We'll be accepting applications through June 5th. Uh, once that period is over, then all the proposals will be reviewed by a committee, uh, which is made up of four members of the Wills Board and two Wills staff members. The committee works together as a group to review all the proposals and make recommendations of which projects to fund. Um, then that list is shared with the Wills Board for final approval. And then by September of 2023, we'll notify every applicant of the results. And one of the things that I really like about the ideas to action model is that when we announce the funded projects, we also pair up a Wills staff member with each individual project uh, to be a liaison or point of contact for questions. And then if the library or member needs it for uh, offering guidance or input in moving their project forward. So this has been a really fantastic way for individual Wills staff members to get to know our members and for our members to build up their relationships with Wills. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Jen to wrap up our meeting today. Great, thanks so much, Emily. And thanks to everyone who shared today. Um, Ideas to Action is a really proud program for us and I'm really grateful to our board, many of whom are here today for your support in continuing this. Um, and for all of you and for our members sending inspired ideas our way. So it looks like we do have some time for questions. You're welcome to put those in the chat. If there's anything from the wills update or back to the beginning of the, of the presentation, any remaining questions, you can throw them there. Um, 
I'll, I'll just kind of keep talking while we watch to see if any questions do come in and say that as you leave the meeting, um, don't hesitate if, if, you know, after things have percolated a bit to reach out to us afterwards. You can go to our website, you can contact us via email, follow us on Facebook. Um, we're, we're here to engage and talk with you, so please reach out if you have anything that comes to mind. I'll also just add that if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure you check out our 2022 annual report. Um, thanks to the great work of Andy Coffin, we have again another report that is as delightful to look at as it is to read. Um, you can see all the fun highlights of um, what's happened over the last year in 2022. And, um, and we're, we're, we're glad to share that out with you. So not seeing any questions, we will just say thank you so much. We are appreciative of the trust that you place in us. We welcome all the ways we will partner with you in 2023. Thanks again to our member speakers, our board, and the entire Will staff. So uh, from all of them, I'll say enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a really happy weekend. Thanks so much for your time today.